are reaching the tipping point at which renewable energy is becoming cheaper than fossil fuels. For the first time ever, countries and companies and individuals are choosing solar and wind, not because they're better for the environment, but because they save them money. Let me tell you about solar. The cost of solar has fallen by 99% in the past 20 years, and it continues to get 5 to 10% cheaper every year. And this is creating economic opportunities that didn't exist even three or four years ago. Back in 2010, I was financing renewable energy projects in China. We were financing wind projects and hydropower projects, biomass projects, and they were fi financed using subsidized with carbon credits through a scheme, scheme run by the United Nations. But solar was nowhere to be seen. It was just too expensive. This was only five years ago. Since then, things have changed so much. Between then and now, China has installed 30 gigawatts of solar, which is 10 times the total energy capacity in Guatemala. This is happening so fast. One of the things that I find so exciting about solar is the fact that it happens, that it, it is working on every possible scale, from the poorest people in the world to the biggest multinational corporations. Everyone can have solar, from the farmer who is irrigating his field to the girl who's walking home from school and wants to call her mum to get home, and to the country that wants to light up its cities. The biggest solar project in Latin America is 100 megawatts and it stretches across, um, it has 300,000 solar panels and stretches across 300, 300 hectares. It's absolutely enormous and it powers an iron ore mine in northern Chile in the Atacama Desert, which is one of the sunniest places in the world. And there are many more projects like this under development at the moment. There's a massive boom going on. These huge projects are being developed all across Latin America and all across the world. And at the completely the opposite end of the spectrum, at the smallest end, at the smallest size, solar is transforming the lives of the poorest people in the world who haven't always had access to energy before. And there are amazing companies which are doing this, including in Guatemala, and we've just heard about one of them. Um, these companies, typically, a solar system will be one small solar panel connected with um, maybe a couple of LED light bulbs and a mobile phone charger. And a system like this maybe will cost 15 to $20 um, and will be replacing really dirty sources of energy that these people have been using before, such as kerosene, which causes huge health problems, as well as just being really expensive. And some of these companies are using really creative financing mechanisms to mean that these people don't have to pay for their solar system up front. They can pay for it over time um, using their mobile phone. And once they've paid for it, they get the system for free and they have free energy forever or for as long as the system lasts. And this is happening at a really huge scale. One of the biggest ones of these companies is a company called D-Light and they have 49 million customers around the world. So if they were a normal energy company, they would be the ninth biggest energy company in the world by number of users, which is absolutely extraordinary. And it doesn't just work at either end of the spectrum. This solar is creating economic opportunities for people, for people in the middle of all different kinds. On the residential side, the residential solar market is booming in places like California and Australia. And in Australia, where I used to live, 20% of houses now have solar on their roof, which is amazing. For businesses, it's also transforming the way they think about their energy systems. For many businesses, energy is a major part of their cost and it really affects their profitability. When energy prices go shooting up, it, it really impacts them. We've talked to a number of, to, to lots and lots of companies in Guatemala and elsewhere around the world who have benefited from the recent falls in oil prices, but worry about what happens when energy prices go up again, which they probably will do sooner or later. And. Um, And, the, and those businesses are able to use solar to lock in their energy, to, to, lo to lock in their energy price now and never have to worry about volatility again. This is extraordinary. So what can stop solar now? 
What can stop it taking over the world and being our dominant source of energy? Well, it can't solve all of our problem problems yet. To start with, solar and all, all renewables have a problem with intermittency. Solar only generates energy during the day. Wind only generates energy when it's windy. So we need something else to provide energy uh, the rest of the time. And right now, we, we're still, we still need to use conventional, conventional fuels, ma mainly fossil fuels, to provide this power. But that won't always be the case. Imagine if we could have a huge battery or an, some way of storing the energy that was generated during the day and generating when it's windy to use overnight. That would transform the way we thought about energy and would mean that we wouldn't have to rely on fossil fuels at all. Well, right now, energy storage on this scale is just too expensive. It's not possible. But this is changing. The cost of energy storage is falling really, really fast. And this is being driven by um, advances like electric cars and laptops and mobile phones, which all need really good quality batteries and good energy storage to enable them to last for longer. And at some point in the next couple of decades, energy storage will reach the point, will be cheap enough, it too will reach the tipping point at which it is cheaper than fossil fuels. And at that point, countries and companies which have invested in renewables will really see a major advantage. The next challenge with renewables is, that, is, is, is about finance and the way that the costs are structured. With conventional fuels, the major cost is fuel. So you pay for your fuel at the same time as you use your energy. Um, whereas with renewable energy, you have to pay for all of the cost up front. The, cost, the, the, the running costs over time are, absolute, are, are really minimal. And this is a big problem because people are used to paying for their energy as they use it. They don't want to have to find a large amount of money up front to pay for their energy. So we need to come up with new ways of financing energy to enable people to reap the benefits of clean, reliable solar without having to find that money up front. And this is the problem that I spend most of my time trying to solve. The good news is that this is possible. And there are lots of investors out there who want to invest in renewable energy. And we're able to, to put in place structures that give them good returns and also allow our customers access to clean, reliable energy without having to find the money up front. And there are innovative way, increasingly innovative ways of doing this which are emerging. Um, in the UK, where I'm from, one, thing that's one way of, of financing solar and other renewables which is coming, coming out is crowdfunding. So individual, ordinary people can invest a small amount of money in a large solar farm and be part of, be part of owning it, uh, can be, own the system, which is fantastic. They can get a, ret a really good, reliable return for their savings and contribute to the transition to a clean energy future, which is wonderful. The, ne the other major challenge that we have to think about as s renewables get a, become a bigger and bigger part of our energy system is their impact on the grid. Our energy grids are designed for large power plants, a small number of big power plants that generate large amounts of power and have high operating costs because they're burning fuel. But in the future, this isn't what our energy system is going to look like. We're going to have a large number of small power plants spread out all across the country, much closer to where people are using the energy um, and much smaller systems. And this is a really different way of designing a grid. And from an engineering perspective and also from a funding perspective, we have to completely rethink things. In Europe, where I'm from, in some countries, <coughs> Uh, renewable, renewable energy is reaching a uh, penetration of 20 to 30 percent of the total energy um, that's being used um, in the market. And we're having to redesign our grids. We're taking the grids that we, that we designed 50, 100 years ago, and we're, we're shaking them up, we're changing them. Now, for countries like Guatemala, where <laughs> we're building, a, building out a lot more new energy capacity to deal with the growth that we expect in the future, this creates an opportunity. We don't need to build the kind of grids that we had in the past, that Europe, is, that Europe has now. You can build grids that are designed the first time around for renewable energy, for distributed energy. And that's actually what's happening in Guatemala. There's, the, the grid companies here are actively designing the grids now for renewables, for energy that is distributed to near where the people are who want to use the energy, rather than, rather than channeling the energy all the way across the country to get to the people that need it. 
This is fantastic. Throughout history, there have been a number of technologies which have changed the world and really transformed the way that we think about almost everything. The printing press, the steam engine, electricity, the internet, the mobile phone, all of these things have completely transformed the world. Just taking that last example, the mobile phone. This is what a mobile phone looked like 30 years ago, and only a handful of people had them. They were, they were completely irrelevant. Now, there are more mobile phones in the world than there are adults. Almost everybody has access to a mobile phone. Everybody has access to the world's data. And this has been even more amazing in developing countries. Developing countries have been able to leapfrog developed countries by using, though they haven't needed to build out expensive landline um, infrastructure, they've just in installed cell phone towers and they've been ab able to give their people the access to the world's information without undergoing all that expense. And the same can be true of solar as well. Solar is an op and, and small-scale renewables. They are an opportunity for developing countries to leapfrog developed countries. We don't need to build expensive grid infrastructure to reach the most remote parts of our countries. We just need to, to give them a small solar panel and that may be enough to light their way. So what does this all mean for the world? What does this renewable transition mean? Well, to start with, this is going to transform the geopolitics of energy over the next couple of decades. Historically, com countries and companies which have had access to big reserves of oil and gas and coal have had a, have had a natural advantage, quite simply. If you have access to cheaper energy than your competitors, you have a real competitive advantage. And so just think why the US economy has been so successful in the last five years. It's because of fracking, because of the shale gas boom, that has, trans that has been driving their economic growth. And think why countries like Norway and Russia, which have so much, not Russia, Saudi Arabia, have so much, have, have so much oil, why are they so rich? In the future, countries which are sunny and windy will have this competitive advantage. And Central America is one of the sunniest places in the world. This is a fantastic opportunity for countries like Guatemala. And just to put this into context, if you put a solar system on the roof of this building here in Guatemala City, it would generate twice as much energy as the same system would in, on the roof of my office in London twice as much energy. And that means that in Guatemala, solar energy is cost competitive with fossil fuels right now, whereas in the UK at home, it will take another five to 10 years for solar to make sense without subsidies. The next major thing that I find really exciting about this is the democratization of energy. In the past, energy assets have been owned by a small number of large corporations and by the government. In the future, energy assets can be owned by anybody. And a normal individual, you can, own, you can own your own solar system on your roof, no matter how rich you are or how poor you are. And you can participate in crowdfunding to own a small part of a bigger system. We're really changing the power structure in the energy sector, which, is ex which I find extraordinary and really exciting. And finally, this is a rare good news story in the fight against one of the biggest threats to our planet, which is climate change. The world has already warmed by 0 0.8 degrees since the pre-industrial times. And this is already creating climate chaos. We're seeing increased storms, increased floods, increased heat waves. And it is only going to get worse. We will be lucky to stay on, if, if we manage to limit global warming, to three or four degrees. And this is a really terrifying prospect. And we know that global warming is caused by human activity, and it's mainly caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And despite having known this for decades, global efforts to reduce emissions are just not enough to solve the problem. Rich countries are not reducing their emissions fast enough. 
and rapidly industrialising companies are growing their emissions as they seek growth and they're choosing the cheapest ways to, to power their economy, which have, to date, historically, have so far been fossil fuels. But this is changing. As renewable energy gets cheaper and cheaper, these, these countries and companies will be more and more often be choosing to, choosing to invest in solar, in wind, in hydro and biomass, not because not because they're better for the environment, but because they're cheaper. And this change, this tipping point, could have more impact on our ability to, to prevent climate change than any climate policy that, that is reliant on subsidies could ever have. I find this absolutely extraordinary and a great source of hope that we might actually, as a, as a civilization, as the world, have a chance of beating dangerous climate change. And that makes me all the more proud and excited and motivated to do my small part in making that transition happen as quickly as possible. Thank you.